Good morning, I'm Mary Ann Winkleman, President of the Cultural Alliance of York County, and on behalf of my cohort, Kelly Giveaway, Kelly Gibson is our uh, director. Director of Communications and Engagement and the uh, Kingpin of this conference, and we thank her for that. But we welcome you to the Impact Arts and Culture Conference, the first one-day professional development conference for creatives and those working in the arts and culture ever held in our region. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and for those of you who have traveled to join us here in York, welcome, enjoy our city, and we're so happy to have you here. Change in York over the past decade can be characterized as nothing less than phenomenal. And it, it emerged with the simple realization that creativity has transformative powers. Creativity reflects the heart and soul of each of us, regardless of age, ethnicity, or stage in life. The Impact Arts and Culture Conference is one of the many programs the Culture Alliance is bringing to our community to continue this change and enhance its creative economic vitality. By collaboratively leading the cultural community and focusing resources to grow and develop the men and women working in arts and culture in our surrounding regions, we give them the tools to transform their communities. Community building programs like the Impact Arts and Culture Conference didn't happen with the efforts of just one organization, like the revitalization and cultural re re renaissance happening throughout York. This conference has been born to the collaborative efforts and help of many talented, creative people. A very special thank you to Dr. Pamela Gunter-Smith of your college. <laughs> Dominic Delagarpini, from, uh, also from the College of Human Affairs. Thank you very much. And actually, the whole staff of your college has been very helpful and, and believe in the power of this IMPACT conference. So thank you all of us for all of you for helping with that so i'd like to ask uh, dr gs to come up and have a couple words so good morning everyone good morning. we are so happy that you have joined us today i always have a I love to have an opportunity to show off our beautiful campus uh, and I hope that uh, on this gorgeous day that you will take the time to enjoy all that we have. But the campus and this facility is a building. What is special about York College are the students, the faculty, and the staff that make this institution what it is. So I hope that while you're enjoying our facilities and your conference, that you get a chance to experience or feel the warmth of this community of learners. Um, I can uh, uh, recall when this project was mentioned to me, uh, and of course as president, as you might imagine, I all, all I have to do is nod and say yes, and then there are all of these other people that make the things happen. So I too would like to thank Dean Della Carpini, who is our academic dean, who is also our community li liaison extraordinaire, Sherry Heflin, who is our events person, the IT staff, but everyone who makes this conference uh, possible and provides this opportunity for your college. Uh, I will just end by saying that this week is also very, I would say, uh, important for me professionally and personally, because three days from now will mark the completion of my first year as president of this institution. And it has been... <laughs> And one of the things that I was very interested in when I uh, took the position was the opportunity to be at an institution where there was such a synergy between the college and the institution. And so when Kelly and Marianne came to me to tell me about the Cultural Alliance and they said, oh, and by the way, we're having a conference. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could ha have it at York College? I never hesitated. Uh, with respect to saying yes. And finally, we are an educational institution, and we believe in this merging, if you will, of professional studies with a strong foundation in other types of disciplines. This project, the Letter Letter Campaign, is an excellent example of what we try to uh, help our students to understand, and that is the intersection of the arts 
with the social studies as well as the environmental uh, studies as well. So this is right up our alley and I think it's going to be, uh, I have a major impact on our uh, city and the students here. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for allowing us to host this and I wish you a wonderful conference. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Diaz. We are thrilled to be here. It's a great collaboration. So thank you to all of our uh, conference sponsors and they're listed in your program. I know you'll take a moment to look at, at that. They made this event possible and through their sponsorships, provided scholarships so that the cost would not be a barrier to anyone who wanted to attend. That was just a fabulous addition to this. <laughs> also, of course, we want to thank the whole uh, conference committee who helped, the se helped shape the sessions that you'll be attending today. And thank you to our partner agencies of the Cultural Alliance of York County, the Strand Capital Performing Arts Center, the um, York County Heritage Trust, York Arts, York Symphony, the Greater York Dance, York Junior Symphony, York Art Association, and York Youth Symphony. And I really can't do that without notes, but not when I'm nervous, so I just want to be clear. <laughs> but they're a great group of folks. We're, we're proud to, to um, have them as partners. But it was their desire to sharpen their skills so they could better serve the community. That was the impetus for us to create this conference, and we're, invited, we're thrilled to invite the entire uh, region to join us here today. So now I'd like to introduce the uh, very exciting uh, special guest speaker we have, Patrick Dahlheimer of Think Loud Development to help us open our conference. Patrick, thank you. Hello everyone, uh, I am Patrick Dahlheimer. It's nice to be here in York, PA, my home, our home. Should be everybody's home, but we can't fit everybody. Uh, it's nice to see friends in the front row. Uh, first lady, Paula. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, where I came from and what brought me here today. Uh, I was born and raised here in New York, PA. Uh, I started a band called Live about uh, 20, 20 some odd years ago. Uh, to give you some highlights or lowlights, uh, we're at about 30 million records sold, uh, Rolling Stone Artist of the Year, Billboard Artist, Artist of the Year, uh, three number one records, a whole bunch of top 10 singles and 20 years in the business. So uh, it's come a long way. Uh, we started the band in eighth grade at Edgar Fall Smith here in the city, uh, York City School District. Uh, we were all taking private lessons from uh, our school instructor, Don Karn. And Don Karn had a fabulous idea that I should start a band. And uh, I thought, wow, that's a pretty cool idea. I started a band. He said, uh, you should probably get in the talent show. We went in the talent show and uh, won $25 and thought that, you know, this is it. I've just realized my dream, you know, if I can stand on stage and uh, perform and uh, get $25 a night, you know, I, uh, I'd be living a, a grand life. So from then on, I think I had realized my dream. My dream was to use my guitar and my artistic outlet to communicate to others and to eventually travel the world and things beyond. Uh, after that eighth grade talent show, uh, three other members of my band every day continued to uh, write and rehearse and sit in the back of science class and draw what our stage would would appear you know we design our light show and our science teacher would often wonder what we were doing and we were happy to share our uh, stage plot with them uh, again say i was hooked my dream was beginning to really take shape uh, Throughout high school, we played everywhere, anywhere we could play. Uh, we weren't old enough to get in the local bars. Our mom and dad would drive us 
to shows here uh, in York and in the regional areas. Uh, we began to promote our own shows locally, uh, which was a big deal at the time. You know, 17 year old kids being the, the local promoter was not uh, the norm, to say the least. Uh, we also began, began monthly drives to New York City to promote the band at uh, most famously CBGB's in New York City, where uh, we soon became friends with uh, Deborah Harry of Blondie and, and, and Chris and Tina of the Talking Heads. Joey Ramone of the Ramones. All of a sudden, these silly young kids from York with dreams were beginning to meet their idols and uh, the future looked bright to say the least. Uh, soon after gra graduating high school, we landed a record deal, MCA Records, and uh, released our first record in 1991. And uh, over the next 18 years, we put out eight records. Uh, we scoured the world quite a few times on tour. Uh, performed at, I always say, the other Woodstocks, not the original, but the, uh, the two rebirths of Woodstocks. Uh, performed at Tibetan Freedom concerts, uh, played Hyde Park for over 100,000 people. Performed on SNL twice. Uh, headline tours from South America to South Africa uh, to Australia and all over. We've performed for uh, Nelson Mandela, President Clinton, Madonna, and believe it or not, a, good, a few times we've uh, performed for the good people of York, to say the least. Uh, to kind of bring you current on what we are up to, uh, Live has just finished recording a record It'll come out in October, and we plan on once again traveling around the world and promoting that. And I think that inherently we take York with us and we promote York and the arts everywhere we go. Uh, we took the band took a hiatus about five years ago, and I thought, okay, this is my time to take a break, slow down. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's uh, that's what my partner said to me. Huh. Uh, I, everyone had, the other members in the band had started to spread out amongst the country, uh, living in different parts of the country. I had recently moved back to York and began to realize that this was my home uh, and that I loved it here. Uh, friends, family, uh, there's just a uniqueness to this community that I love. So slowly, one by one, I began to bring my bandmates back to York. Uh, started out as drinks and dinner. Uh, from there, it was a few nights of uh, late night jamming, you know. Uh, and I think we started to realize that we had refound or rediscovered our home, and it was York, PA. Um, we reconnected to the work ethic, the artistic sense, and the pride of our hometown, and uh, we were proud to be Yorkers. Uh, with that uh, commitment, we decided to lay down roots in York, which we had never done. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, we decided to build our headquarters, recording studio, rehearsal studio, and various office spaces here in the city. Uh, purchased a building at 210 York Street in downtown York, and uh, it was a big white elephant. It's still big and white, it's not so much of an elephant anymore. But uh, that currently houses, uh, like I said, our, our studio, our rehearsal facilities, offices, and uh, headquarters. Uh, since opening the studio in late November, uh, we've recorded a record, finished a new record there. Uh, we've had seven-time Grammy, Grammy winning uh, mixing artist Tom Lord Algae has worked there. Uh, great band from the 90s, Everclear, has come to town to record a record. And uh, there's a lot more in the future to be booked and to be working uh, at the studio. So who would ever think that uh, we could get these artists to come to York, you know, national artists, recording artists, audio connoisseurs. Uh, strangely enough, I believed it and my partners believed it. Uh, 
We are slowly taking uh, a little corner of the city that's seen better days and uh, hopefully we're reshaping it and inspiring others to, uh, to dream, basically. Um, I say, how did I get here today with all of you? And then that's pretty much uh, one person who dared me to dream. That uh, was my music teacher, Don Karn. Uh, he challenged me to take what I love, which was music, and do something with it. Uh, and that's why I'm here today. Uh, I would say my question to you and everyone out there is, uh, who are you going to dare to dream and how are you going to dare them to dream? Uh, every person counts, every dream counts. And uh, I guess I'm a living example of that. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm going to introduce the First Lady Susan Corbett, who is the chairwoman, who you may or may not know these facts. Uh, Susan is the chairwoman of the Pennsylvania Council for the Arts, a trustee of Carnegie Museums in Pittsburgh, an ex officio member of Philadelphia Museum of Art Board Trustees, a trustee of Lebanon Valley College, and a commissioner of the PA Historical and Museum Commission. She has dedicated much, much and a lot much, excuse me, much of her time to promote the arts in Pennsylvania and, in, and indeed is a woman who is daring people, young and old, to dream. Uh, beyond that, I know Ms. Corbett as a kind, thoughtful, gracious woman. Uh, it's with my pleasure I introduce First Lady Susan Corbett. Thank you. Um, I should say, um, Patrick, uh, the, his, I hope you were listening to his words. If you were watching his demeanor, take his words and put him on a stage with 120,000 screaming fans, <laughs> and then you have a better idea of who Patrick is and, and his partners. Um, I'm so excited to be here and to be able to um, congratulate you on your wisdom in showing up at this uh, impact conference because I know it's going to be an exciting engagement for all of you and how wonderful to be here in York for this very important announcement about art space. Um, we had the pleasure, Tom and I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Patrick and as they call themselves Chad G and Chad T, um, the members of the live band when uh, Paula Vitz, whom uh, everyone who lives in New York knows Paula, um, first introduced him, introduced them to um, my husband Tom and said, you, you have to meet this band in New York who's doing some really interesting things. And um, if you know Paula, uh, if you don't respond the first time, uh, she keeps coming back. You have to meet this band in New York. They're doing some really interesting things. And, uh, and then she says it again. Now, okay, now you have to meet this band. And so uh, Tom um, had lunch, I think, with them and heard what they were doing in York, Pennsylvania, uh, which is taking their success of, uh, of what they've accomplished in the music industry and creating a whole new creative industry here in York, Pennsylvania. Um, Anyone that could have that dream in eighth grade and, and make it happen and make it happen on the level of success that these uh, gentlemen have had, um, you have to pay attention to anything they want to do. And I think uh, their business success is, uh, as successful as they were as a band, their business success is, um, is just in its infancy and I know that they're going to just do amazing things in York, Pennsylvania and all across uh, Central Pennsylvania, so congratulations on all you do. And if ever there was an example of how music and math connect, it's live. So congratulations. <laughs> and I think there is something in the water here because uh, for those of you who are not from 
uh, York. Uh, you have Jeff Coombs, uh, who just took over the Whitney in New York uh, for his one-man show. You have Live, and I just learned about a composer. Um, where are our friends from Art Space? Are they still here? This is an 85-year-old composer yeah. in Minnesota. Pardon me? Dominic Argento. Dominic Argento. Yeah. 85, yeah. composer, lives in Florence and Minnesota, but he's a York, Yorkie? Yeah. York, Yorkie. 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 <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's a native of York. He still claims York as his home. And so uh, you have these amazing artists that are coming out of, of York, Pennsylvania. And certainly it's because all of the elements here in York are working. And, and I want to uh, compliment the Cultural Alliance of York County uh, for all the work that you're doing. Marianne, not just you and your current staff, but uh, Joanne Riley, who started this organization and convinced the community, the business community, that this was the future of York. And um, you know, you see it in Pittsburgh, you see it in Philadelphia, and I really think that now the really excitement in the arts is happening in York, Pennsylvania, and it's because all of the pieces, the, the uh, elected officials, the, the cultural alliance, the artists themselves, believe in York and, and are investing in this community. So very exciting time uh, to be living or visiting York. Um, I should tell you a little more about myself uh, than Patrick did. I, um, when I was in junior high school, I thought I was going to be a professional artist. Um, when I started college, I thought I was going to be a, a performer, a pianist, concert pianist. Um, and then I met my husband, and I thought he was more fun than practicing in the basement of the music hall. Now, maybe that's where I made my mistake, because I don't know, this first lady gig, uh, it's been pretty good. Um, but I did, I did spend my career in arts management, and uh, I spent a lot of years managing a literary arts organization in Pittsburgh. And I always thought that writers, artists, uh, dancers, Actors, maybe, were the most interesting, <laughs> smartest, obviously most creative, but certainly um, the people that I would want to spend most of my time with. And so uh, I was appointed to the Arts Council about 14 years ago um, when my husband became governor. Uh, the first thing I asked for was to chair the council because the Arts Council, like many artists, uh, we're going through a really difficult time. Our budget has been cut in half. And, um, and, and in Pennsylvania, um, the Arts Council not only runs some really important programs, but also distributes state funding to, to arts groups. And so I thought if I could stop the bleeding, um, at least the arts community would have a voice at the table um, if I were chair. And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, even in tough times, we've been able to uh, leverage the funding that is available for the arts and uh, make sure that this very important aspect of living in Pennsylvania is not lost. Um, I want to uh, just introduce, speaking of the Arts Council, a couple people who are in the audience, and I encourage the artists who are attending today to talk to them because they are fabulous arts advocates. Um, first of all, Paula Bitts, whom uh, I introduced, Paula, would you give a little sign so everybody can say hi to you afterwards? And Bob Pua, who has been uh, just a force here in York long before he joined the Arts Council. I believe, Patrick, you told me that um, Bob was one of your initial investors in the band, is that right? Or in your project in York? Yeah. Chad told me. <laughs> well, I'll talk to Jack. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, great supporter of the arts uh, here in in uh, York and um, and in the project that Live is doing now. Um, and then I'd like you to meet Philip Horn. Most of you, if you're from Pennsylvania, you've known Philip for a long time. Um, Philip has is sort of an anomaly in state government. He's the executive. Executive Director of the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts. And usually that position changes with every governor. He survived uh, and, and overcome four <laughs> governors <laughs> because he is just that good. And so we're really um, pleased that Philip has been uh, with us in the Corbett administration. Um, so, for, so for that, I just want to say um, thank you to all of you. I know you're going to have a fabulous 
um, a conference today. Uh, you've come to a great place to experience the arts, and uh, so welcome to Pennsylvania and welcome to New York. Thank you, First Lady Corbett. Thank you, Patrick. What a great opening. How lucky are we in New York to have this kind of power and influence. Mr. Pulo, I want to mention, and Paula Bitz are both, we're honored to have them not only on the Council of the Arts, they are on the, the board of the Cultural Alliance. So we got some real power here. We thank you all. Welcome. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker an artist who used her work to enact social change in her neighborhood, which then spread into her town and is now changing communities all across the country. 2014 Creative Impact Arts and Culture Conference is pleased to present Litter Letter Project founder and uh, graphic design artist, Rachel Hatley. <laughs> Um, thanks for inviting me. I'm truly honored to be here and after that huge, fantastic, um, inspirational stuff you've all been talking about, I'm getting a bit jealous that I don't live in your Pennsylvania. <laughs> so we'll have to change that. Um, so yeah, um, I'm here to uh, share with you the Little Letter Project. Um, in 2001, um, my family and I made a big drastic change. We had spent 12 years living in the city of New Orleans and we moved out to the country. And when I say country, I mean country. 3,000 people live in my town and we live on acreage and um, there's not even a Starbucks, it's ridiculous. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. so um, at the same time, it was really primarily so that um, after 20 years of being a graphic designer and photographer and teaching for uh, 10 years, I just wanted to go back to grad school. I was the mature student. Um, so I enrolled in Vermont College of Fine Arts in the MFA Graphic Design and I knew, uh, you know, I've, I've always wanted to do the MFA but I didn't want to do the MFA and just churn out a bunch of design and say, yeah, I've got an MFA. I just wanted to do something more meaningful, you know, I spent 10, 15 years working and designing um, great stuff really, I mean, you know, logos, brochures, that type of stuff, but it, it was just something not quite as meaningful with just working with a client or a couple of people or five, you know, um, people in the audience. So, so I wanted to do something a little bit bigger. Did not know it was going to involve litter. I hate litter. <laughs> I cannot stand it. Clearly, I'm not originally from Louisiana, y'all. So, um, <laughs> and there is litter in England, but there's some very hard and fast rules about it. So I sort of grew up and. Um, it was sort of drilled into me that you don't throw that stuff on the floor, it's naughty, you don't do that. You know? so, um, so moving to Louisiana, there's a huge litter problem and I didn't realise it quite so much until I was living an hour and a half north of New Orleans, which may be crazy to you, anybody who's been to New Orleans and saying it's certainly not the cleanest city. Um, but in the country, there's something about the space, I don't know, people were driving along the highway throwing it on the highway and all of a sudden I had a patch of that highway. You know, I had like a mile stretch along the highway and every week I was picking up litter and it pissed me off, <laughs> honestly. So combined with that and um, going up to Vermont, which is very clean and has no litter apparently, um, going up there and explaining this problem, you know, we had an independent study program who said, why don't you work on that graphic design problem? So this, I'm here to share my story. So that is my highway, my highway, part of my highway. Um, so I'd always been pretty much boarding on obsessed with typography. Um, I was the kind of kid that was, you know, age 10, all the kids were playing outside and I was inside drawing out letter forms, you know, that type of thing. So I knew, I knew that my life would involve type for some way. Type and litter, not. Never saw that connection until two years ago. So, so I went back home um, after my decision to make a litter project, and um, it all sounded really, really good in Vermont. You know, you're around artists and <laughs> environmentalists and people that are really forward thinking, and then you get to rural, sleepy, y'all, deep south, Louisiana, 
and I'm stuck in the middle and I'm like, uh, yeah, I said I was going to make something with literature and typography. How's that going to work? Um, I had two children. The great thing about having young kids, right here is my four-year-old Samuel at the time. The great thing about them is they do not question your sanity. <laughs> so <laughs> I said to him, we're going to go to the we're going to go to the hardware store and we're going to buy some wire of some kind and we're going to pick up some trash and we're going to make stuff. And he was like, cool. So um, that's what you're seeing right here. I went up there and I, um, so May 9th, 2012, this was the dilemma I was facing. And I'd also told a lot of people that I was going to do something, so the pressure was on. Um, when I say I'm an artist and a designer, I use that term really loosely because I've been doing a lot of stuff on the computer. I haven't made things with my hands, other than a cake. So, um, so I went to the store and I bought some chicken wire, as you see. Samuel's still totally into it. He's like, yeah, let's do it. We're making it. Let's make a letter. Um, so this is really what happened. It, um, started prototyping it. Um, actually having a lot of fun. Litter is disgusting. It's hot in Louisiana and um, it smells. And I don't like that. But um, like I said, I, I was I was in, I was invested at this point, and I kind of like the absurdity of it. You know, it was a little different to, you know, teaching in design and working on a um, computer coming up with a nice polished logo. I was like, now I'm on my back porch with trash and, and chicken wire. So, so really, these are at this point two years later. I feel slightly cringing when I look at this because I'm like, they're so beautiful now. Um, but I felt like it was important to share this because at the time, I was so happy with this. I was like, these things look cool. Um, but not for, the reasons, not for the reasons that I originally thought. So the first um, initial change for me when I started working on this was I started sharing it. I hadn't been a shared type person. You know how the British are. You know, we like to keep ourselves to ourselves and we don't hug and we don't share our work. So, um, so this was a di this is a different thing, you know. I started working on this, and I had some great classmates who said, "Share that stuff. Show us what we're doing." So, um, yeah, there was something very freeing about that, and throwing something out there before it was even finished, you know, just to see what people said. So, what had happened here was I started using the, the larger chicken wire. It actually ended up being very easy and fun to work with. I was covered in scratches. Mm -hmm. um, because I couldn't quite get the whole um, uh, having gloves on, um, so I did it all by my hands. So, um, so what happened was I started posting these pictures, and all my friends and classmates are graphic designers, and they said, "Well, what about serifs? And how about some thinking about more structure and some more beautiful type?" So um, I was like, it's chicken wire, people. <laughs> it's glitter and chicken wire. Okay. Let's think about some beautiful parts. Um, so I took some cardboard and I, and I, you know, I printed them out on the computer and I drew them out like this and started putting them and they started to just form better. But it was really still by hand, still by just my knowledge of working with type for two years, at, at 20 years rather. So I realized, you know, I was putting these ideas of putting a message out there. You know, I really wanted to say that I was pissed off on the highway and I was like, I can't do that. That's not going to make me any sense. Um, and plus it, you know, that was really just my response. It didn't make any sense for me to just put what I felt about this. I wanted to see what other people felt about this issue. Were there people in my community that cared about this issue like I did? And there were. There were many of them, and I think that was one of the surprising things. I think we have these assumptions of our community where we live. We assume everybody, you see trash on the side of the road and you assume people are fine with it. They're not, you know, the most people are not fine with it. Um, so initially it was kind of baby stepping for me, sharing this stuff. Um, and what better to do it with uh, a scout group? who were really into fun things. So, so what I did is I, I took the prototypes that I had, a couple of the letters here, and we walked around the neighborhood and we talked about recycling. And, and as we were doing it, I realized, I went in there thinking, well, this is just gonna be an educational thing for the scouts and I'll just ask them some questions about recycling and I'll be able to do these check marks of, yes, I, I did this for grad school. But what happened was, you know, it was the grandmothers and the mothers who were coming up to me and saying, 
is, is it really illegal to burn trash? And I was like, yeah, kind of. Can I really not, not um, burn a piece of plastic on my property? No, that would be illegal. You know, so it started, these questions were really surprising me because the people that just didn't know, didn't know. You know, we don't, it's a, it's a town of 3,000 people and, and it's a very close-knit environment. You know, there's not many outsiders that come in and not many people leave. So, um, you know, the teachers are their aunts and uncles and so, so they know what they know. So, um, so I realised, you know, we were, there, was, there was a huge gap here and it was not just with the kids. The kids actually ended up knowing a little bit more about their responsibility. So, so after, after I'd gone through that, I went into the, um, the high school and rather than just go in there and give them some letters and say, let's fill them, I said, how about we make some? You know, and this was still at the very raw prototype level. Um, I was going in there saying, you bend it like this and expecting that I would have to go in there and say, this is step one, this is step two, step, step three. But these are country kids, kids, sorry. They make chicken coops on a weekend, you know? <laughs> so they actually taught a lot. They taught me a lot. Uh, again, something that was totally unexpected. I went in there, I mean, admittedly, I was talking about kerning and serifs and, and geeky type stuff, um, just because I love to talk about that. And, um, you know, but ultimately they were teaching me, oh, well, this, you know, if you did it this way, Miss Hatley, you know, so, so they, they were much more familiar with that material and it was fun. So what happened was I took some of my letters and they, they had decided, we did a vote in the classroom and I said, well, what do you guys want to make? And they said, well, what do you want us to do? And I said, it's not about me. What do you want to put on the, on the front of your school? So they decided they wanted to make go green. At the time, I was still in this, this is not quite aligned right, this is not quite, they're all out of proportion, and I was still in that, I was going to let it go, you know, because this was not me, this, this was them, this is their interpretation of what this looked like, and um, I was trying to, you know, sort of educate a little bit about design along the way, so I just realised at that time that this was something, you know, I don't know what this is, but it's something, and it's engaging people, and it was, it was, um, it was giving a lot of people the opportunity to talk about stuff they wouldn't have initially talked about. And people that I met through doing this, um, you know, like I said, was surprising. This is a very small town, so when we did this with the 11th and 12th grade, I'm in the grocery store the next week, and the parents are talking to me in the grocery line. So this is not, you know, a design project with a few people in a, in a specific meeting. I'm dropping the kids on the carpool line and people are stopping me, winding the window down saying, no, my, uh, my daughter made that in, you know. I was like, okay. <laughs> so, um, so I knew it was connecting. I, like I said, I just really couldn't put it all together at that point. Um, the great thing about the uh, program at Vermont College of Fine Arts, uh, which I highly recommend, um, it's an independent study model and every six months you work from home and then after six months you go to Vermont and you're in residency for nine days and you do a um, presentation similar to this and you talk about what you did for the six months and then you plan for the further six months. So, so what I did is I took the care letters to Vermont. And when I say took the care letters to Vermont, I shipped Louisiana litter in a box <laughs> to Vermont. Right? <laughs> I mean, that's what you do. I, I, I thought about taking the letters empty, getting to Vermont and filling them on site, but there's no litter in Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> and all the litter in Vermont is healthy and organic and, and breaks down because it's all made of beautiful packaging. And I was, I was had beer cans and, and things like that. So yeah, so I shipped trash to Vermont. Um, but, the the, but the beauty of that was that I then got in a room with 35 graphic designers and advisors and teachers who started to say, you know, started to sort of give me ideas about now what, you know. I was like, well, this really could end at this point. I could just go back and do something else. I was like, no, I think there's just something here. There's still that huge gap in where I'm living. And I was only thinking very small. I was thinking the 3,000 people. Um, so, so, like you said, I'd taken this picture right before I went and I was like, these things look so big, right? They look so big when my kids are holding them. They're two feet. Of course they don't look so big now because we're standing next to this one. But at the time, 
you know, it felt big and I got up to Vermont and I was like, oh, it's kind of small, you know, we need to start, maybe we should make these things bigger, right? And that's really what, this is really why I'm standing here today. Um, so, so when I came back, I started to reach out a little bit deeper than the scout group and um, the schools. And I knew, I knew Keep America existed, which is the national organization for environmental and liter literal awareness um, nationally. And in each state, they have a Keep Pennsylvania Beautiful, Keep Louisiana Beautiful, and so on. So I contacted Keep Louisiana Beautiful, and I pretty much pitched this idea, and I said, I'm not sure where this is, I'm still developing this, but I've been doing some things with the kids, and um, you know, it seems to me that um, a lot of people that work in this type of litter awareness environment are, are kind of tired, you know, they're tired of, of trying to come up with new ways and just a new approach and, and a way to sort of connect more people than the, than the regular people that only care about the issue that, at hand that, that week, you know, so, so and especially in a smaller community, um, you know, you've got 10 people <coughs> on the board and where I live in Washington Parish, parishes, um, counties are called parishes in uh, Louisiana. Um, so in Washington Parish, in, in the board of Keep Washington Parish Beautiful, there was 10 people on the board, and that 10 people were on the board of everything else. You know, so, so every time there's a board and every time there's a community meeting, it's the same exact people, right? So they're a little jaded, they're tired. So I, so I contacted them, and I contacted Keep Louisiana Beautiful, and um, I'd just gone into a meeting with these two foot letters and I said, look, I, you know, this is going to sound a little nuts. And, you know, it, it did. Um, you know, to them, I was a person with a foreign accent that was not from here, that was walking in there with a, a letter R filled with trash off my highway <laughs> and saying, you should do this. This is a good idea. Um, so, um, resistant, I don't think covers it. <laughs> and um, there's, de there's definitely that moment of really okay so um so what happened is i started going to the monthly meetings and i thought you know i, I started to really learn more about what what was going on what were they doing in this community is is this going to help them or am i just pushing this on there because i think it's great um so after a few months went by i did their logo I did some signs for them. I did everything that I think needed to be designing for them and stuff that they didn't have, um, you know, for free, because I really wanted to sort of get into helping them in some way, you know. And I didn't know it was entirely this, but, um, you know, ultimately it ended up that way. So, so they got to know me and, and they said, well, you know, Rachel, this is all very well and good, but we have no money. You know, this is going to cost money, right? I mean, at this point, I just spent my own money buying chicken wire. Um, so I'd gone to keep Louisiana beautiful and they said, well, you know, we really don't have any grants and, you know, I'm sure there's many people in this room have gone to places and they said, well, we don't really have any money for that, but it's really cool, thank you. So, so, um, but there was something about, I don't know whether it's something I said or something, something that just kind of touched on um, the idea of working with, and um, where I was living was one of the most remote um, areas of Louisiana and here I was this English person in this very very remote part of Louisiana and I think Keep Louisiana Beautiful had I think they kind of got a kick out of it to be honest with you I think they thought it was kind of quirky and funny and wouldn't it be funny you know um, so she said you know I can't give you a, a regular grant but we do have three thousand dollars left at the end of this year and um, if you want to apply for it and put in a grant um, you know we'll, we'll see what we can do we'll talk to the board so I did that, um, you know, I went back to the locals and they said, oh, you're not going to get that, that's ridiculous, that's, they're not going to fund this, this is crazy, it's nuts. Um, I said, well, maybe it's not, you know, let's just try it. So at this point, you know, they were only two, they were only two foot high, so I filled out this, um, actually I didn't even fill out a grant form, I created my own because I had to design it. Um, <laughs> it was a word document. I don't want to fill in a word document. <laughs> so I grabbed their logo. I said, "Can I have your logo?" She's like, "Why do you need that?" I said, "Because it's gonna look pretty on the page." Um, so I redesigned it and um, created it how I thought. And you know, anybody in here that's um, 
you know, never done a grant before, um, you're sort of pulling all this stuff out of thin air. I mean, you don't know, right? You've got to put in a deadline, and you've got to put in how much materials cost, and you've got to put in, like, how many people are going to help you do this? Well, I barely got these people sort of in this idea. So, um, you know, so it was, it was definitely, um, I definitely exaggerated a little bit. <laughs> don't quote that. Um, so, Anyway, so I put it in. So this was um, probably about eight months after I first initially created the letters. And um, she called me one day and she said, I'm, I'm giving it to you. She said, but the only problem is you've got to find matching funds. I was like, are you kidding me? I can't, you know, I said, that's not going to happen. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just fund this thing myself or I'm just, you know, not going to do it. So anyway, she said, you know, I just like it and I like you and I like the fact that you're trying to, you're trying to you're in this community which we've never been able to get motivated and really do something different. Um, she said, I'm just going to let it slide. So, so she was fantastic. Lee Harris of Keep Louisiana Beautiful. Just have to point that out. So we, so we got the money. And, um, and then, you know, had to plan this thing. I mean, at this, but like I said, at this point, I'd still only got two foot tall letters and I was going to make them bigger. Well, how was that going to happen? Uh, I don't know. In, in my head it worked, but in reality, you know, sitting around a board, they came up with a lot of reasons why it wouldn't work. You know, they said, well, you know, we put them eight feet tall, people are going to knock into them. They're going to cause accidents. They're going to fall. Is it going to smell? It's going to cause them. I mean, you know, all the things of the reasons why we couldn't do it. And I said, yeah, but we've all got the money. We should just go ahead and do it, right? You know, so, so we planned initially to to do six words in where I live and this involved going to the mayors um, the grant was tied to the government the local government excuse me and um, our board felt that it was really important that the mayors of each particular area made the decision over what we were saying and um, where they were going so um, I didn't quite agree with that um, because I wanted to sort of pull the community, but I just at this point I wanted to just let's get one out and see what happens. So, so on our board, um, you know, it's the the guy that runs the landfill, it's the master gardener, it's the um, LSU Ag Centre people. Um, I mean, individually these people are phenomenal people, and um, assistant warden of the local prison, of course, right. So, um, so we're sitting around, you know, trying to figure out how to make these bigger. And I said, there's got to be some kind of framing and stuff. And the warden said, you know, we could weld something like that. Um, the inmates do this type of thing all the time. And uh, I was like, inmates, that's interesting. Um, he said, yeah, but it's not going to cost us anything. And we can just put the um, materials together. So initially, we just decided as a group to just spend $400 of the grant. I got kind of scared. I was like, oh, we're going to spend, I know it's not an awful lot of money, but it's, it's a lot of money to a small, a small, small town. And I didn't want it to mess up, you know. So I said, well, let's just spend like $400. Let's get the first word done. And if it's absolutely awful, we'll go out and we'll find more artists and stuff. So, so this was the, um, this is what happened. Um, I went to the prison and I, I took some literally six foot tall cardboard letters um, that I'd made and I went in there and um, tried to talk to them about Sarah's and, and proportion and, and, and scale <laughs> and they're inmates and they're, they're a prison warden they were like okay yes ma'am yes ma'am yes ma'am um, <laughs> and I said um, you know I said is there any way I can come in and, and talk with the guys that are going to weld and they were like no ma'am <laughs> so I was like well I really excuse the bad accent sorry um, I said, you know, it's going to be hard for me to like envision this project and not be there. And he said, well, we'll just send you pictures and stuff. And I was like, well, I, uh, are they going to be good pictures? Are they going to be high resolution? They thought I was nuts. So anyway, I said, well, why can't I just go in there? You know, these people are not like hardened criminals or anything, are they? And they went, yes, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, uh, okay. So they're not like murderers or anything. Ah, yeah, it's possible. Like, oh, so, a person who is a convicted felon who may or may not have hurt somebody created these beautiful <laughs> letters <laughs> that I got from an iPhone, not even an iPhone, a regular camera. Um, phone so 
I was floored. I thought, this, this is something. This is, I mean, this is not somebody in there that's just putting this together because they've been told to. This is an artist who's made a mistake in their life, but for whatever reason, but is skilled, you know? So this is when it got really exciting. Um, they went ahead and they wrapped it. Again, they wouldn't let me go in there. Um, so that was kind of a hard part of the project. You know, we were all sort of set back and everybody in my community is so relaxed and calm and, and oh, I'll be fine, y'all, you know? And I'm like, <laughs> you have no idea. I was kind of freaking out a little bit, but, um, but when I saw it, like I said, I was just so excited. I mean, they look great, they were real. I, by the time this had happened, I had had this project in my head for almost a, almost a year. In my head, wandering around, thinking about these letters, thinking, oh my gosh, how are they going to look? Um, and this is how it looked. It was phenomenal. It was one of the most exciting days ever. Um, the, also, the chairman of our board was the manager of the landfill. So during the time that we were planning the letters, he'd made um, pickups and picked up the litter and he stored it. And we actually got use of the landfill to fill them. We got community people come in. In Louisiana, the inmates also, they're very important in the community. Um, the inmates collect the litter off the highway in orange bags. And they wear orange and uh, white striped suits. So orange is the color. So what you'll see here is, um, you know, the orange bags and then they actually put in, in the, uh, into the letters. Now having filled them at two feet tall was one thing, but filling them at this point, we needed a lot. And I didn't realize just how much litter there was. There was hundreds of bags that were picked up over a week collectively as a community. And it took, it took about 95 to 100 bags to fill the first word of pride. Um, one of the mayors wanted the word pride. And then we still had a ton of litter left. It was, it was kind of sad for um, we, we started to develop a method, you know, I mean, shoving this litter in, we were editing the litter. We took out diapers, we took out any remnants of food, not that there is any remnants of food because there's a lot of raccoons and stuff. Um, but we took out, we took out the, uh, the liquids in the bottles and then put the bottles back in. Um, and I'd, I mean, at this point, I really didn't know how heavy these things were going to go. So the frame itself is probably about 30, 40 pounds, something like that. And then when it was filled, it was getting up there. We packed it really tight. Like I said, the, the climate is really hot in, um, in Louisiana and everything expands and contracts all the time. So I knew if we didn't fill them entirely full, we would end up with um, letters that you know, had a lot of space in them. And again, it's a, it's a design thing, right? I wanted, I wanted the, lit, the litter to be like pushed into the serifs and things. So, so, so it's like, well, I'm not, it's not going to work if, if it's just straight. And then, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a disease. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so, so I was there and I was around this whole thing and I, you know, I was directing. I probably annoyed the heck out of these people. Um, but they were great, you know, I mean, they, you know, they really just took it on. I think once we got the money and once we started building stuff and st soon as it was happening, it happened, you know. And this is one of the, the great things about living in a small town community. When we started putting these on the back of the trailer and getting to the sites and realizing that something was uneven and um, not quite right and then we have to figure out how to put them in the ground, they had the city there, they had maintenance guys there, they had trucks. They'd call them on the cell phone and within, within five minutes, there'd be like 20 different service people. Okay, what do you need? Jack Hammers and all kinds of things. I mean, it was, it was you know, I started to realize the beauty of this, that small town and the skills that they had. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was fantastic. So um, this was installing. Um, we figured out that collectively, again, this was not something that I actually thought through that well. Um, because I'm just thinking about the aesthetic and where they're going and what's behind them. Can I take a little picture and, and this type of stuff? But um, we ended up getting um, a foot size rebar, just literally just bending them over, driving them into the ground. Um, all of the sites that we looked at were actually on grass, so it was all dirt underneath. But for the most part, they just were driven into the ground. This right here is Lacey. Um, she always had a skirt on, I don't know. We were, we were always doing trash and she was always... So nicely dressed for the trash. Maybe she knew I was taking pictures and I was going to come to York one day. I don't know. Um, anyway, this is people kerning um, when you spacing out individual letters equally. That's called kerning, adjusting the space between two characters. We use people to do that. 
people of the same width and height. So that's, <laughs> that's my people <laughs> permanent prop right there. Um, April 2013, this was the first one that went out exactly a year to the date till I sat on my, since I'd sat on my back porch and said, let's make some letters with trash with my son. Um, they were on the, right in front of the courthouse on Main Street and they caused a stir. People were, there were some interesting responses. Let's just, let's just say that. Um, most of it was just fantastic, can't believe it. Um, there was a lawyer's office that's on the other side of this. They, weren't, they really weren't happy. Um, but it was a good conversation. I mean, the idea of this was not, I think it's pretty much accidental that it became art and, and people looked at it as art and they, they appreciated it and said it's so, you know, there's some beauty in it, which like I was saying to earlier before, I said, you know, letter form to me is beautiful. What's in it is not beautiful. What's in there is a statement about what we've picked on the highway that people have dropped. So, so it's still a statement and it was, you know, at that point it was kind of like, it's not art, it's a statement. So, um, so the responses I was getting were sort of all over the map. Um, once we decided that hardened criminals are really fabulous artists, um, you know, they went ahead and did, did the, whole, uh, the whole project for us. I mean, you know, so, so it took about a week to, a week to two weeks to wrap, um, sorry, to, to make each word again. You know, these were the words that I, that I initially had put forward collectively as a group, we decided, and the men ultimately come on and said, yes, we want that one. The word why was kind of like an afterthought that actually sits in front of the, um, the drive up to the landfill. Shockingly enough, you drive up to the landfill and on the 200 yards land, <laughs> driving up to the landfill, there's trash. Well, there's litter. I mean, it, it, yeah. So he was like, why? You know, so he wanted that there. So that, that was his statement. Um, so I'm going back to Vermont six months later. And of course, I'm shipping trash again back to Vermont. Um, but this time it's six feet tall. The one in the middle right there is um, how I wrapped it. I, <laughs> I learned that if you wanted to wrap if you want to mail something that's 100 pounds and it's an odd shape and um, it goes on a big semi, um, and uh, you know that was the cheapest route to do it. And in order for you to pay less money on a semi, this is an insider tip, make it a really weird shape because then they don't put stuff on top of it. Once it's not stackable, they just throw it on the top and you don't have to pay for an extra special semi part of the truck. So all these things I've been learning, it's fantastic. So anyway, this went to Vermont and that week I went, this is actually my graduation, you know, during this time, um, something that I've missed out uh, a little bit, was I was writing an awful lot about behavior and, you know, thinking about the design, the design thinking process. Um, this was not just me sitting in a, in a room saying, do this, do this, do that. It was, like I said, it, it, I was studying what people were doing, studying how helpful people were or not. And I was bringing, um, figuring out, you know, just who stepped forward and why and, and, and these types of things. So, so by this point, I'd written the thesis and, um, and the, um, the installations were finished in Louisiana. So there was a lot of press and stuff. Um, Keep America Beautiful got hold of it pretty much by accident, Facebook or um, social media. And, um, you know, I'm pretty into the social media. So, like I said, I'd, I'd started sharing this and, I'd, and you know, I'd made a website with electroproject.com and I'd put, I'd put what we did on there and I'd put it on Facebook and people start to find it. I think everybody in the different communities were looking for, for, for a new idea. Keep America found it. I was driving back from Vermont, back to Louisiana, with the trash, like you do, right? And um, I walked into Keep America offices. I emailed them and I said, do you want to just see this thing? There's something about looking at the pictures it's quite a different experience seeing the whole, um, the whole final product. So that, this is really what happened. And again, as I drove back into Tennessee, somebody from Tennessee, Keep, um, Laura Howard from Keep Severe Beautiful, um, contacted me and she said, I saw this project, I'd really love to do it. And um, can I, you know, can I, can I take a look at it? I said, well, you know, it just so happens. I'm in a U-Haul and I've got six foot of trash with me. You want to see it? So, I saw her on the way back down to Louisiana. Three months later, she had made her own version 
of the project. And this is what happened. It switched from being the creator of this project and the community collaborator, now a little bit more of an advisory role, which has really, really been fun. Um, because I can, I can share the lessons learned in what we did um, in order to help them. These guys, um, she, they wanted to make the word why, and they had their high school entirely by themselves draw out the letters. These guys, are, these kids are 15, 16, and 17. Um, they drew out the letters by themselves. They welded them by themselves. They did the whole thing, and they had rebar, just happened to have rebar in their thing. So, so for them, it was pretty, uh, pretty easy for them to replicate and, and really fantastic. And that's the teacher right there being really happy with himself because he was looking for a new project. So, um, so that, one, that one went out in uh, March of this year. Um, Keep Phoenix Beautiful had contacted me. Um, they have a 15 acre plot and they were hosting the Clinton Global Initiative University Conference where they have 600 students from around the country and the world on, a 50, on their 15 acre site. And they were putting in vegetable gardens and uh, murals and things of that nature. And they wanted to use the project as a signage issue. Um, they had an all-female learning class, Xavier College Prep School, again, 15, 16, 17 year olds, um, welded these letters. And rather than use this for litter, they actually used it as a recycling tool. So everything you see on this site in downtown Phoenix is every item that you can actually recycle in Phoenix. So that's going to become a permanent, um, a permanent signage. I know we're kind of getting close on time, so I'm going to rush through a little bit. Um, Des Moines, Iowa also um, was probably the, uh, the strongest relationship I'd had to date with another state with people I'd never met before. Um, we talked an awful lot on the phone about this. Um, she'd gone to welding places and tried to get people to make the letters. She loved it and she, she simply couldn't find them in time for, for them to make letters for Earth Day. So she actually went out and, um, and commissioned an artist, Steve Murger, who, um, who welded it. The, the, um, the difference with this one was that she actually had to go out and get funding and that was the hardest thing for her and it took her about six months from me talking to her to actually getting that out on the street. The wonderful thing about this is that she started, she used um, kids that were much younger than I, I had been using in this project. She, they went to the elementary schools. Um, so, so that was a really exciting um, thing to see. They made hope, they made think, they just got funding to make the word care, and they just put in a huge grant to make six more, and they're gonna spread them around Iowa. So, um, good for them, it's, you know, amazing. And we're here. Da, da, da. Of course, the best one, right? The best to last. All right. <laughs> so, my time at um, Vermont College of Fine Art meant that I met some really good people and, and developed some really good friendships. Troy Patterson, sitting at the front right here, teaches at this college, and um, became a very good friend of mine, and a huge supporter. If anyone's writing a thesis or, or trying to do something in their community, that guy right there is going to help you. So, um, so he was, uh, is Kelly in here? Okay, Kelly. Hi, Kelly. Hi. Um, <laughs> Kelly and um, Troy, and I mean, I don't have to explain how you all know each other. Um, the Kelly had contacted me a few months ago and um, said we really like the project, putting on this conference, blah, 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 and you know the rest. But um, Kelly is a dynamo. If anybody yeah. in this room does not know that, she's like, I wish I would have Kelly and all of you guys in York in Louisiana when I was trying to get this off the ground because it was um, a lot more difficult. Um, but yeah, so, so uh, you guys did the vote and put. Um, you went out to public vote, which is what I wanted initially when I first started this project was to, you know, survey the community. What do you want to say? What is, what is, what do you want to say out there? And what do you want, you know, how do you want to have an impact on this project? Use it in any way you want, but, but ask tons of people. And that's exactly what Kelly did. Um, Kelly and everyone in the Cultural Alliance and all the partners, Keep Your Beautiful, they, um, they invited me on the conference calls when you guys were making the letters here. So that again was, uh, um, you know, I, I was honored to do that. And, and, you know, it was really interesting to be on the conference call, but step aside and see how you guys work together. Because ultimately, the project is pretty much the same in every community, but it's been used differently and different kinds of people have worked on it. So again, it, you know, still on the, um, 
study head of mine. Um, so Kelly, who's on many, many pictures, um, I believe it was pouring rain last week and cold and um, and um, you guys uh, got this you got this done. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm still amazed and I'm still humbled by anyone who gets this done, you know? There's a lot of people who talk about doing things and want to do things and have always wanted and just don't know how, but people get these done. And I do want to point out that it's a lot of women getting these done. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Um, we need the guys, we really need them, but you know, spearheading these things and, 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 and organizing communities and finding out how it's done and putting it in a, putting it in a place and collecting litter and, and trying to involve as much community as you can with all ages of the community, it's hard work, right? It's not, this is not something that takes five minutes, it takes months. So, so but ultimately we're all the same, you know, we're all the same kind of people. Everyone I've spoken to in every single state, we think we're different, but we're all the same. We all want the same things. We all want our kids to be in a community that's clean and tidy and, and picked up. And we all want everybody to, you know, take some responsibility. So this may, may or may not be a solution to that, but it's an, it's an effort. It's an example. It's something, it's, it's an idea, like I said, that, that came from some random conversations and um, has now touched hundreds of people. I've had their hands on this and as a designer I truly believe that you put your hands on something you're emotionally invested in it you know everyone that's that's picked up litter that's wrapped this wire that's been involved in the welding that's even talked about it in a meeting that's got involved in the installation that said yes people that have said no they're all invested some way in this and I don't think you know this has been a life-changing um, a life-changing project for me because I, I've never thought about art and design and thinking that way and it's really really powerful this is you know like I said it's gone from me and this quirky idea in this little little tiny town in Louisiana and look what's happened so this is really this is probably <laughs> half of the people because the great thing about people that work on these projects are so humble they won't give me everyone's name you know I mean there's hundreds of kids there's hundreds of people behind the behind this list that um, have had a part in this. But like you said, these are the um, shout outs right now that I do have my website that I will keep I will keep adding on. Um, and this is my final. I know I'm trying to rush. <laughs> um, this is um, you know finale. I mean, I say finale, but it's not. I mean, this is this is like an ongoing thing in Louisiana. We are. Um, we, you know, as of, as have been out like a year now, so we're emptying out now, and we're moving them around to different locations. We're giving them schools, and we're letting them use them in, in educational purposes. Or, you know, I'd initially considered or, or really wanted them to sit out on, the, on a particular highway that was very littered, empty, and then daily have everyone use it as a trash can. Um, so um, I've been talking to some some states are, are really interested in doing that with the school environment. So. So I hope to see that in the next few months too. A um, uh, couple of things. Um, Tennessee um, love the project so much, they're going to debut a word every single year. So that's kind of like their program in the school now. Um, I'm also talking with Abilene, Texas, and um, the state of um, Baton Rouge in Louisiana. So, so that, like I said, this, you know, this, this really just started as a small idea, just a way to approach something differently, involve all aspects of the community, and um, try it, right? I mean, try it and see what happens. Time will tell. A lot of people come up to me and say, well, has it, has it reduced the litter? Maybe, maybe not. But I know that it's touched the people that have worked on it, and the friends of them, and the schools, and, um, and, and the idea, um, like I said, I'm at this point now where, I am sort of surveying everyone and asking them a bunch of questions about what's happening now. You know, I'm not, I'm not ready to walk away from this and see, you know, what happened six months from now? Did it change? And the majority of responses I've had have said people have been so proud to have worked on something. You know, the eight-year-old and the 15-year-old and the grandparent has never done an art project in their life and they work, they work on it and they drive by and they see how, you know, they worked on it, they own it. So. Um, 
so yeah, I just just want to wrap up to say um, it's a shame I don't live in York, Pennsylvania. <laughs> you have a bad city. Um, thank you for listening to me. I know we're running short on time, but if anybody wants to ask me questions, I'm going to be around all day. So thank you. Rachel, thank you. That's a fabulous project. Um, I called. Kelly, a lot of things, but I think dynamo is the right word. You do it. Uh, Kelly did that in an amazingly short period of time here in New York. Uh, the only disappointment, we don't have syrups. I thought we should have syrups. <laughs> Too bad. Troy, Troy, Troy has a comment about that. I'm sorry? Troy, no syrups? We wanted something a little beefier. Beefier. For your you absolutely. Look at some of the other letter forms. It does stand out. We Just love them. If you haven't seen them, and I bet driving in here you did see them, they're on what we call the grassy knoll across from the parking ramp uh, at York, at, um, uh, yeah, York Hospital. So I uh, hope to see them. They'll be there, I think, two months. We're very proud of them. We dedicated them yesterday. Rachel was able to join us. So it's a, it's a real point of pride for us, the Cultural Alliance, and, and it should be for you as a Yorker. So, um, Thank you again, Rachel, for the uh, everything you've done for us here in New York and for coming here today to share your story with us. Um, we have a very exciting uh, conference. We're going to get rolling. Um, we, we've worked very hard to put some things together. We think I've heard so many people say, I wish I could go to all of them at the same time. There are four in the current track. Look, what's said here, we don't want it to stay here. We want you to be tweeting. Get it out there on the Twitters. We want you to use the hashtag impact. Oh yeah, there it is. It's on the back of your bed. Kelly took care of that as well. Um, ImpactCon uh, 14 is what we'd like to use, so get it out there. Let everybody hear.